Well, can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. How are you doing? <laughs> it's always a nightmare, these things, isn't it? You never know how they're going to go. Um, okay, well, welcome to the podcast then, Fast Chip Performance. My name's Tim Davies, uh, backgrounds in the military. Um, for those that don't know, then Will was a teacher who was dismissed from Eton. Let me know if I get the language of this right. After you uh, made a video as part of a lecture series, which was about um, the patriarchy and, in effect, the paradox of the patriarchy, which was quite an interesting uh, way to go. And then I think, if I remember correctly, was it not the refusal to remove that from your personal YouTube channel that caused the issues? Yeah, thanks for having me on, Tim. Good to talk to you. Yes, that's broadly correct. The lecture was made for a course called Perspectives, and it's the college's flagship debating course. So the idea is that points of view are put forward to the students, and then they're all actively encouraged to disagree with the point of view. And I knew that they had been getting regular sessions all about toxic masculinity, and that was a big part of their academic diet at the school. So I thought, give them a presentation which suggests that masculinity isn't all toxic. What have men traditionally been valued for? And the patriarchy, having some benefits to women and children because men have been encouraged and valued for providing for women and children and protecting them. And this caused offense. A member of staff complained that it created a hostile work environment under the Equality Act 2010. And that if this member of staff was asked to allow boys to discuss it, then there would be something deeply offensive about that. So it got pulled from Eton before it was ever shown to the kids. No child ever got to see it as a lecture. It was already on my YouTube channel, which had a disclaimer from the college saying that these weren't college views. And they told me to put that disclaimer on. When I was asked to also take it off the YouTube channel, because of the disclaimer they would told me to put on it, which seemed absurd to me, I said, no, look, this is about freedom of speech. The kids need access to these different viewpoints. If there is something really wrong with it, let me know what it is. I'll edit it out for you. I'm happy to change the lecture. But there yeah. was no dialogue, no discussion. So I ended up just leaving it up there as a point of principle for free speech. And so from leaving up there, I mean, I think we're probably very similar because I started a YouTube channel when I was in the military and no one never said not to, but wanted it. The, the, the chief vest staff said we must engage. Engagement was a huge thing. How do you engage? Yeah. You reach out to the people, you tell them what we're doing. When you start burying things like that, then I don't think it leads to any good. And, and I was told to take my channel down and I thought, well, I'm 40, what was I know? I must've been 37 years old at the time, you know, a bit long in the tooth there. I'm doing exactly what the chief of air staff says, exactly what he says. No, I'm not going to. I wasn't doing anything wrong. And it just, it didn't get worse from there, but it never got any better, to be fair. So you left it up. I've watched it several times. I know that um, Constantine and um, uh, Francis commented on trigonometry as well. I think people should watch it on your channel, which is growing by the day, by the way. I keep seeing it doing this, like that. Um, there wasn't, there wasn't, I couldn't tell any aspect of that, that I, I even went and did a whole world of research. There was nothing in there that was contentious in any way. So what was the issue that the college actually had? Did they have anything on you whatsoever? Well, this is what is intellectually interesting about the case, because if someone says they have been harassed, then according to law, they have been harassed. That's all it requires. They just say they have been, and therefore they have been. Now, it has to pass the reasonable person test. So is the claim of harassment reasonable? And this, I think, is why so many people came out to support me during the appeal process, during my firing, because the college ultimately had a choice about whether being upset by ideas in the context of debating is reasonable as harassment. And very sadly, they came down on the side of the complainant. And the precedent this sets is that if anyone ever gets upset by any idea whatsoever in the context of debating courses at Eton, then that's gross misconduct and a sackable offence. There's a misconception about my case that it was my questioning why I should take it down that was the big problem, but actually it was the content, it was the ideas that was the root of the college's objection. They only asked for it to be taken down because they objected to the ideas. The ideas came first. 
objected to the ideas, which is an interesting thing, to be fair, because if we're going to look at the progressives and how progressives tend to work, especially in woke culture, they don't tend to go after the ideas as such. They tend to go after the individual um, ad hominem attacks, which yeah. I was quite surprised at because I would have thought that it would have been. But you have an unblemished teaching record. There has been nothing in your past at all that anyone's had any issue with. This is why it's yeah. quite surprising. Something I actually read back on, I actually went and found just the, the, the way that the college, if I remember correctly, said, it said the college's approach to equality and diversity, which it finally claimed you had breached, I think you wrote this yourself in The Spectator, yes. has never been explained to staff, making it impossible to follow. Mm. I mean, how does that even work? So <laughs> how, do, how, can you have a, how can you have a policy that has never been explained? Or is this just part of the, the genre we're in right now where we make it so complicated, we bring in new words and so nuanced that people can't understand it, therefore you're always going to fall foul of whatever, whatever the new policy might be? Yeah, the, my barrister said that he hadn't seen anything like this before because it means that the goalposts are just constantly shifting. You don't know exactly what it is you have breached and it makes the, the game hard to play. But essentially, it leaves it open so that anything anyone objects to, uh, you can get pulled up on. And that's the death of any kind of serious intellectual climate, in my opinion. If you can't express ideas and you're constantly worried about offending people, you can't think things through. The whole point of free speech is that we get the marketplace of ideas and the pearl is formed by abrasion. Mm. You get to test the ideas out. Can they stand up to discussion? And if you can't do that, what's left? Yeah, you have to risk being offensive and you have to, to risk being offended, don't you? That's the whole point of free speech. And if we stop this now, well, then surely that's a, that's a form of oppression and it, it seems to be it's very interesting you said something i'm going to move on into. the reason i say this is um your, your students your students actually said i think in your defense if i'm correct here and i'm not doing that thing where it said and it's i'm bringing up stuff it's just there were some interesting things and i think you had a relationship with students that that might be rare but you probably still have to be fair in the work you're doing now they said young men and their views are formed in the meeting and conflict of ideas so with that, that's, that's one of the things they said in your defense when they wrote in your defense. So, and I remember reading another paragraph somewhere. I like this a lot because this, this makes me laugh. I, went to a, I, went, I went to a comprehensive school, but the military is a bit like this. Um, you said, one of the things I'll miss about teaching at Eton is the ever-present threat of an ironic riposte from one of the boys. <laughs> you said, cheer up, I told one, who looked unenthused by Milton, understandably so, in my first week at the school. Uh, you said, 200 years ago, you'd be down a mine. And he said, sir, he replied, deadpan we'd have owned the mines <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's brutal it's br i love it it's brutal but the truth is you're, you're i think schools like this are are these guys coming into schools with an intellect already that's been formed by their parental upbringing or is the school solely responsible for for doing that it's a selective school so they're all passing a test to get in so they're all relatively smart to begin with most of them have been to elite prep schools already so the school does add value over the five years. I think much of it is social and it's to do with the boarding house environment and the sports pitches. Yeah. I think the real value for money in Eton comes from what is outside the classroom more than inside it. Teachers are teachers ultimately, wherever you go. And the kids have bow ties on in class, but really it's the social aspect and the five years of bonding with each other. With each other. So that um, all male environment, I think, has probably got some parallels to the military. Yeah, it does. It, obviously, now the military has gone. It's adopted this. I don't want to say woke culture, but I would say progressive yeah. culture. Understandably so, because of the maybe the the people, the, the young people coming out now, and it's, things do change. Where it's it has got quotas. It will tell you it hasn't got quotas, and of course, it's trying to promote women up to senior ranks, and it's trying to um, obviously bring in a lot more ethnic minorities. Of course, uh, even though it will go to the point where we have to say to the military. Right, you've got 3% blacks, you've got 18% ethnic minorities, now you're going to stop. And of course, that's the problem, isn't it? When you start bringing people in, when do you stop bringing people in? If you want to do this, you want to make it representative of the society, which a military should not be, by the way. A military should be made up of the most fiercest, angriest fighters in the world. All the people that can do the tech stuff, and that might be fine. But a police service, of course, a police constabulary, especially the Met, well, that should be balanced and representative of the population it serves, understandably so. Not so a military, but unfortunately, the military is going down that line. But you're right. I think I gave um, what I liked about these schools and I haven't been to many, although I've been to Eton because I knew uh, David Forrester, who was the head of the cha uh, Catholic chaplaincy down. There. I don't know whether he was there at the same time as you. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. He dragged me when I was a, a very sort of nasty young eight year old 
uh, he was in the Portsmouth diocese that I was a Catholic part of. My mum offloaded me to him and he looked after mm. me for the next few years, you see. And I still see David and he's uh, on his last legs up in Scotland, but he's a good man. I spoke to him about two weeks ago. So he ran the Catholic chaplaincy down there. Uh, I went down, used to have tea with him all the time uh, around Eton. And one of the things I realised with these schools, I gave a brief talk at rugby. When I went up to the economics department to give the talk, on the walls were written quotes by people like Milton Friedman, Friedrich Hayek, um, Adam Smith, John Maynard Keynes, Mark Zuckerberg, Peter Thiel. Then you had even Tim Ferriss had a quote up there. Thomas Sowell had a quote up there, which I'm a big fan of Thomas Sowell. Uh, there was Thatcher quotes, Reagan quotes. There were quotes from people you would not have expected. The most random of things. And I remember thinking... In my schools, we had textbooks. We'd open at page 61 and we'd read the textbooks. There was nothing there outside of those textbooks. But in these schools, wherever you went, you're being fed and nurtured from different angles. That seems that seems something that's quite unique to the public school system. Yeah, I think it gives them a real sense of self-belief as well, especially when you get the achievements of some of the old boys from the institutions on the walls as well, because it gives the boys the sense that, well, if they've done this, having been through these same corridors, then why not me? And I remember having a two-week camping excursion with some of the Eton boys and a local state school in Scotland. And halfway through, we had to do some interviews, just asking them about what their future plans were. And it really struck me how the Eton boys had this sense that they could achieve anything they wanted to. And it wasn't so much about academic grades. It was more like the sky's the limit because they could see that from their own school, these other guys had gone out and done the same kind of things. So they knew they were following in their footsteps. And that kind of boost, I think, is the best thing they get from these institutions. You know, we've done 15 minutes and I, I can't believe we've even done 15 minutes because th there's so much that we could, we could cover here. Is it, it's so interesting you say that. So when we start looking at um, equality, equity, obviously these kind of aspects of current life that we're going through, yeah, we can yeah. understand, of course, that a lot of people are going through, say, secondary education where they, they don't have those beliefs. Those beliefs aren't there. They're not getting them from the parents. They're not getting them from friends. They're not getting them from teachers. They're not getting them. If anything, it might be the reverse. You know, you're never going to make them. I, mean, I had this. I went to a school where people said, look, don't pick a career flying jets. You're never going to get there. And they were right. You know, I was never going to get there. I failed my A-levels. And I had to go to do an H and D. Even now, today, I would never get into the Royal Air Force with the grades I had at A level. Okay, I would never. They wouldn't accept me. I had to join the Navy, flew in the Navy, and I transferred to the Air Force to fly these big jets here. It just happened to work out that way. But I was told the whole time uh, that I was never going to get anywhere, and just I guess more than by chance or effort, somehow I did. I, I was going to talk to you a little bit about. And this is interesting now because I think we're being going to not necessarily talk about feminism. I want to talk about religion and idolatry. Mm -hmm. Because in the absence of religion, I don't know whether you're a religious man. Well, I haven't. I don't know whether you talk about it at all, are you? Yeah, Catholic, yeah. Catholic, okay, fine. So we, there's something in common here right now, although I'm not necessarily practicing. I'm thinking about going back into it because there's something inherently missing fundamentally from my life. And I believe we're seeing this in society as well. I spoke to David about this recently, actually, David Forrester. So you're a big family man. You've got five kids, one on the way, I believe. So, yeah, a, six now. Just six, born, yeah. Yeah, seriously, congrats. That's a big, yeah, big thanks, job. Yeah. Bigger car on the way then, isn't it? I mean, yeah, yeah, we've got that. Yeah, took some finding, yeah. <laughs> car and trailer, I was going to say, what carries that? Um, brilliant. <laughs> so when we look at uh, the absence of religion, which I think we could we could comfortably, argue, comfortably argue is, is is happening in recent times, you, you said something that interested me, amongst other things, of course. You said you cannot be human and not bow down to something. It's either God or idolatry. So is this what we're seeing now with climate trans activists or trans activisms is this what we're seeing that people do not have a religion in their life so they go and find one mm, that is a a line from dostoevsky's notes from the underground he says that such a man could not bear the weight of himself so yeah. at some point we all have to bow down to something and i think the saddest cases are when people don't even realize they're doing it so there's this need to give something a capital letter and you can watch it march around the alphabet if it isn't on God. So for some people, it's going to be climate. And I think the woke movement ultimately is a kind of surrogate faith. It's this attempt that we might be able to bring heaven down to earth. And if all the problems stem from some kind of faulty political system, if we fix that, then utopia is going to be here. So that's why you get this kind of moralistic fervor surrounding the activists and demonization of anybody who disagrees 
And essentially, when I was being called misogynist in the press for a lecture that most women, including my mother and grandmother and sister, approved of, because it's just basic traditional values across the centuries. When I was being called a misogynist for that, I just translated it as heretic. I think that is basically what it means nowadays. These words that get thrown at you just mean that you have transgressed the, uh, the dogmas of what is essentially the new religion. Yeah, I think I said it makes a lot of sense because something else you said here as well, I didn't really want to delve that much into feminism. I'm, I'm interested in feminism. I get called a misogynist as well. I put mm. pro-women in my bio. Pro-women, if you put pro-women and anti-woke in the same sentence, you just get well, people launch at you. I am pro-women because <laughs> I've got um, a mother, uh, I've got two sisters, I've got three nieces, and I'm married to a woman. And my father died back in 2011. There's only myself, my brother, and my young nephew, Noah, who's eight years old in the, in the entire family. So, of course, I'm pro-women. I want to protect women's spaces, and that's a whole has a whole line we can go to go down to can't we something you said was uh, alert a new word licentiousness um lacking legal or moral restraints especially or disregarding sexual restraints i was chatting to my wife about this yesterday uh, and it tends towards the end of days or whatever you want to call the end of days the breakdown of, of civilized culture um how everyone will, will kind of portray that and when we look at race relations oh is someone shaking the jar out there intentionally to to bring Stability within the UK, especially America is a different place. We know this, but within race relations, is someone purposely doing this? And if so, what is this about? Why would that be happening? Do you think? Well, uh, you get some of the the early Frankfurt School theorists, who are a group of German intellectuals from 1920s, 1930s, who realised that the traditional classical Marxist hope about the revolution coming through purely economic means hasn't really turned out as they planned. So they want to figure out what some of the other weak spots of society might be to try to get the uprising going. And I've heard it argued that race relations, particularly in the US, are considered a weak spot to probe at. And if you can set people against each other, then you can really get that oppressor oppressed dynamic to work in your favor if your goal is to try and tear down the status quo. So I think there's definitely something to it. And I think that the male versus female oppressor oppressed narrative as well is being used in a similar way. What the ultimate goal is, I'm not sure if there's a real substantive vision for what people want to replace the status quo with, but a lot of it is just rage against the existing order. Is this the long march through the institutions then that we're talking about now? Yeah, that, I think that came a little bit later in the kind of in, in right. the 60s, but certainly yeah. that was set out by the Italian theorist Antonio Gramsci as the best way to get this done. He wanted it changed from the bottom up. He felt that education was the best way to bring about political change. So education changes culture and then culture changes politics. And we now, I think, are really feeling the impact of what is essentially a whole generation of students, you know, 20, 30 years or so, all being filled with one particular way of looking at the world without too much opposition from the professors and teachers. Yes, but you said yourself that the right don't really fight, that the right tend to use um, popular narrative, well, use narratives or discourse and, and we use argument. And one of the things that was very interesting, and I completely agree with this, by the way, and I've read a lot about it, is the, and I hate to say left or progressives, or what do we call them? I don't yeah. know, but let, let's call them progressives, shall we? They see speech as violence and therefore they don't have to listen to it because they probably never experienced violence themselves, to be fair. I've experienced a lot of violence in my in my life and I'd rather someone chat to me than throw a punch, you know what I mean? But mm. they don't understand this. So they have no, and I've got something down here about this. If progressives see discourse as the tool of the oppressor and don't take it seriously, how are the two sides' arguments ever going to be resolved other than through violent means? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't think there's much hope of appeasement being a profitable route here when trying to deal with threats to not just academic institutions but to the judicial system as well that are essentially uh, mortal threats there are people who think those institutions are fundamentally corrupt and need to be completely torn down and they're now infecting them from the top as well now can you reason with an unreasonable person i don't think so so the argument would be engaging them in debate 
is opening yourself up to exactly the kind of uh, manipulation that they want to weaponize. So why bother? Ridicule is a possible response. I think some of these arguments don't deserve the time of day. People should just be more blunt with them. But then ultimately, it's about driving people out of institutions. Otherwise, the rot is going to sink deeper and deeper. So driving them out, and I, I completely agree. <clears throat> I um, I get blocked a lot by a lot of people, and uh, normally they've got rainbow flags in the bio or, or, or pronouns. I tolerate. I don't tolerate pronouns very well. I've never asked anyone to respect mine. I, I don't really. I've got a name, haven't I? You know. I think it's the audacity, isn't it, of someone to think that we're going to speak, speak about them in the third person when they're not here. That in itself has a very much a, a, a level of self-absorption that we. Mm. I don't know whether I've ever experienced that. Um, do you I ever believe- get asked your pronouns? Sorry, have I ever got asked? No, I never yeah. have. No, no, me neither. In a whole whole you know ten years working at Eton, no one ever asked my pronouns, even though pronouns were becoming quite a thing towards the the end of my time there. It's strange. If you respect it so much, why aren't you asking people it? Well, you're expendable, Will. You're a white middle class male um, over the age of sixteen. So you know, we, we care about women and children in our society, but men, we used to send them out to battle, of course. So maybe people aren't caring about your full stop. If it was a, a woman, maybe asking another woman, they, they may ask about pronouns. But I don't know anyone that's been asked their pronouns. Uh, I genuinely, I think the, I did a video on this about the Royal Air Force and it was a bit facetious, but I do reach back into the Air Force and people speak to me, of course. I've been out for about three years yeah. now. But there was a young uh, Typhoon pilot, um, so a, a guy flying fighter jets, who'd um I, had he put pronouns oh i think he's being asked to put pronouns in his bio and he refused mm-hmm. and i think the the issue there was many issues but one of the things was um that he'd written a contentious statement about how fight pilots are there to go and do the fighting and if you're not then you're there to support them and it was just having a bit of a dig at, you know it was all banter and he got basically hauled and and the thing about the complaint as well it was an anonymous complaint it was upheld against him against the pilot but the complainant was never revealed. They never had a face-to-face. Let's chat about it, of course. Same with me. Yeah. Yeah, I remember you saying this, actually. That's a very good point. So even yeah. though someone complained, I'd read this, you were never able, because you said, well, come on stage and debate with me, and we'll, we'll give the lecture together, and you can put your points across. Yeah. You didn't do that. No, that, that offer wasn't taken up. I actually asked for that to happen even before I started putting the lecture together, before the complaint came in, I wanted it to be a debate because I think people get more out of that when they hear both sides going against each other. Because the point of debate is for people to learn from each other. And ultimately you both walk away with the truth. You've got nothing to lose, but what you're wrong about. So what's there to fear? Um, That was turned down. And then I never found out who complained. Um, So it's very strange, the whole anonymity behind the process. Do you reckon there was a complaint? <laughs> I'm sure there was a complaint. Yeah. yeah. But it, um, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if uh, after that initial complaint, there was an attempt to get a few more people to complain as well. Well, this is, I think there, there's a book written, wasn't it? The Eight Steps of a Woke Attack. I mean, I've been attacked by a young army officer who, the thing about the young army officers, it seems, is they, they are very much um, told that they are the center of everything and they've got to look after their men. So they get this kind of sense of, virtue virtuous it, it seems i don't fully really understand it but then of course this guy was campaigning for trans rights he's an army officer for crying out loud what's he doing doing you know what i mean what's that about but either way bios full of pronouns flags everywhere british army and um i think i challenged him on something and then it was the screeching it was the the loud pointing and screeching and trying to bring his friends in and then he wrote to all the companies i'd worked with in the past which is why i had to bring legal action against him you know i wouldn't have normally done but he started reaching out to renault formula one and some other people i'd worked with and um, uh, GCHQ and some other people in the Royal Air Force saying, do you realise this guy's a transphobic bigot? And then some people will come back in and say, no, it's a philosophical argument. You know, it was, I think the argument was a classic um, are trans women women or something ludicrous, you know, I mean, that you, yeah, yeah. that whole mess, that that is a mess online. Um, but the it was just that attack, that build-up of got to bring everyone else in, the pile-on, the, you know, the pointing, the, and I remember you said something about this, it's to do with shame, isn't it? This came from a book, didn't it? I've got a book written down here, You'll probably tell me what it is before I find it. After the ball. That's it. Yeah. Kirk and Madsen set the agenda for 90s gay liberation movement. And it pretty much shows us how woke is working. The, labeling you as a bigot, isn't it? And then shaming you, even though, see, I don't really get shamed because I'm big, I'm a bit bulletproof. I don't know why. I, you know, I don't get that embarrassed. But so it didn't really work with me because I just thought, well, who are you anyway? But people do because they've got jobs and everything and they've got families that they want to protect. And 
this is was that do you think them i'll tell you some interesting stuff in that book i've started reading it this yeah, is yeah. That, book that people don't realize and if they did read that book especially when it comes, yeah especially when it comes to minors and things like this that we don't i mean crikey you know i never realized um it's almost like the excusing of pretty bad behaviors well that's even the wrong thing to say isn't it i mean despicable behaviors mm -hmm. within that community that not the gay community but within the, the forming of the, the future community so do you think that that set the tone then for what we're seeing now as a social yeah, justice i i think it was a a very effective set of principles to follow if you want to without making certain ideas illegal making the cost of expressing them so high that people are afraid to. So if you can associate anybody expressing a particular viewpoint with despicable people like racists, for example, then there you go. No one's going to start taking those kind of lines of argument. And of course, the question of whether doubting that trans women really are women uh, is equivalent to being a racist is the whole thing under discussion. Uh, we don't agree with that. But if they can just stifle the debate before it even starts and then suddenly transphobic, racist, misogynist, etc., all get lumped together, then that's it. The sphere of ideas has narrowed what people call the, the Overton window. Yeah. The range yeah. of discourse you're allowed to yeah. discuss has just shifted and then people have been left out of it. They really have. They really have. Also, they're not even willing to say anything. I mean, I can imagine around the coffee table or something like work, they're not going to talk about these things. They're yeah. not going to go into it. Politics out of the office. They tried it at base camp. Um, Jason Freed, I believe it was. He said, we're not going to have politics in the office, not going to have anything at all. Trying to cure this thing. And there was a massive uprising in his company. And he had to go, all right, chat about politics then. Because, of course, I suppose... I suppose in America, and I'm not too sure, having a look at Netflix with the amount of, you know, the, the walkout of Netflix recently, I think he was probably employing a lot of people who were... Um, I say liberal, liberated. I, I don't know how you progressive. I'm not really too sure. When we talk then about, in fact, before we do that, subversion. So I believe at the moment we're being subverted by foreign actors very, very competently as well. So whether this is Russian maskarovka, deception, deceit, uh, pushing agendas, whether that's uh, you know trying to. I, know, I, I was quite a fan of Trump actually. What he did to American policy, I think, gave it a massive jar. And I was hoping it was going to reset itself, and it never did. And we brought Biden irrespective of what, what people's politics is. Um, are we being subverted from ex external actors? Are we being, has this been encouraged by foreign states, especially within the United States, to break down the division, to polarise the, the right and the left? There's no third party, is there, to really put people further than they've ever been, which drives people towards civil war, of course. Do we think that's happening? Uh, if it is happening, I think it's only happening because there's a susceptibility to it in the leadership of Britain and the US. And I think that is, again, coming back to the idea of critical theory and woke movement generally being fundamentally about a, a hatred for your own heritage and institutions. So not really wanting to stand up for what your country stands for and therefore not really caring too much if it is overrun. And there's a kind of unavoidability about this because uh, like it or not, all these nations exist in the, the state of nation, state of nature in relation to each other. And there's going to be a natural hierarchy. So let's say you have the military going woke in the UK or the US. Well, arguably a woke military is going to end up as a weak military. And then you've got China, Russia, some of these countries that don't take these movements anywhere near as seriously. They're going to end up far, far more powerful. And the consequences of that, if it does come to war, are uh, going to be fairly predictable. I don't think it's a coincidence that just as we have a lot of messaging in the media and through education about masculinity being a, a fundamentally toxic thing and traits like stoicism, aggression, dominance, being things that we need to root out of boys. Uh, China has just embarked on a big project to encourage masculinity in schools and sissy boys, they call them in the media and yeah. in pop culture, yeah. have now been banned, basically. Yeah. And they're returning to traditional values about That's family. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's funny to watch the two things running side by side and wondering where it's going to lead.
No, I'm absolutely right. And I saw this with China as well. I mean, I remember an advert came out. I, mean, I don't know why you do this. It's like, are we trying to attract this type of people into the military? Let, let's America put an advert with a, a young girl joining the, the Air Force, I believe it was, who'd come from a two a, a two parent family that were both women, uh, which is how common is that? And then she, you know, it's, and then Russia put out an advert with big men, big guns. That's, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's what military should be. When I speak to the Air Force, they talk about space command and typing, and we're going to, it's like you have what have you got rockets up there or something? No, you haven't. It's what are you doing here? You know, what, what GCH, GCHQ looks after that side of things. You need to present on a front with people that are going to take a weapon system to a battlefield and employ it to kill the enemy, engage with and kill the enemy. There's no role for the military outside of that. If you start talking about peacekeeping and send paratroopers in, uh, they're completely the wrong type of people to send in, but um, because they're very good at doing one thing. So I completely agree. And I saw China returning to traditional values. One of the programs I saw as well, it might interest some viewers on here, was called the American Factory, where there was a glass factory in America. You've seen it. They, the Chinese came in, took over the factory, worked with American workers who were part of a union, I believe it was. And you see how the Chinese are wrapped in and entwined with their company. It looks after everything they do. And you saw how fragmented and lost the American workers were. Mm. At, and that was at this stage a few years back. And I don't know how it is now. I think that we have this issue in the UK where we don't want to celebrate our heritage. Uh, I, I believe to a certain extent there are some people that are embarrassed about it. They've normally got FPBE in their in their bio for Twitter, which is follow back, or sorry, follow back pro Europe, I believe it is. So they were very much in the Remain camp. I was very much a 50-50 guy, to be fair, but uh, you know more Brexit probably than, than staying with what was happening in the EU at the time. But there's this division, isn't there? And I don't know what it takes from going from like this to come back to this just to come back who is the right person is it obviously you know, i wouldn't have said it was a current left-wing or labor government how do we get back into moving back towards each other in say let's say the uk i don't think ultimately the answer is more government intervention uh i think that's part of the problem and people have to come back to the family as the main vessel for transmitting culture and heritage the idea that parents can offload the education of the child onto the schooling system, I think is actually a relatively recent one, last couple of hundred years. And fundamentally, it's always been about the home, parents as the primary educators. And until that starts changing, I'm not sure we'll see much fundamental change because the school system now, if you look at the type of people generally who are at employed at the high level in these institutions universities elite schools normal schools as well and the kind of people they end up hiring it's mm -hmm. likely to just perpetuate the stranglehold ideologically yeah i did see something about the um the policies currently within schools are are or have had a negative effect on young white boys um especially getting into university the young white guys seem to have been left behind i think they're the lowest socioeconomic group when it comes through the end yeah, of school or, or right, yeah, university yeah yeah, yeah. And I, i've tried to camp i mean i'm a, you know i work with all i work with all kind of men some men in a very different position some men in in better positions and we do talk about a family and being represented and, and being that example for the family one of the things i was going to talk about at the very end here but we're bringing it in now was about the role of man and and i mean you still you're still lifting are you you, you still lift yeah. yeah 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 okay so i'm a more body weight guy than, than go and lift massive stuff i'm nearing 50 now but you, you're a you were a, um you're a big lifter weren't you uh, was it deadlifts and everything like that big yeah bar. i like well it started off just uh doing a bit for sport when i was younger kind of you know 16 17 18 and then when i was working full-time and then kids as well it was hard to keep involved with uh team sports stuff so i just yeah. started doing a bit in the garage it's easy to get in and out and yeah. then that became a kind of hobby and i really like the mental benefits of it as well well i was about to say that so here's a question apart from what Jordan Peterson says, why should men lift? Now, why should men lift? Now, I know. I know what it does for me. I know what it does for uh, people that know me. Um, why should we pick up heavy things and carry that burden? What does that do uh, for us? Well, a couple of lines of answering now. I suppose the first would be like biologically or, or psychologically. I don't think men are normal in either sense without some kind of hard physical effort. And that's because, like it or not, our, our bodies and brains are very very little different from how they were in the stone age so you need to give the give the psyche give the body that kind of effort that ultimately it's evolved for and there's a kind of peace of mind that 
comes to men in particular from that, I think. That's why a lot of guys find physical labor, manual labor, um, quite therapeutic mentally. You can get the same thing from the gym. So that's one reason to do it. Another one I think is to do with the uh, self-esteem benefits of pushing yourself, achieving things you thought you couldn't, and then finding that whatever anxiety or fear you might have had about weights that once seemed impossible becoming normal can be applied to the next step as well. So it just gives you that sense of, I can do this. And for a lot of young guys, I think that natural kind of competitiveness and wanting to see what they're capable of isn't really uh, given an outlet in schools because competition often is discouraged mm. and it's everyone's a winner, prizes for all. And people know there's a kind of emptiness to that and they want some more substantial achievement. So in powerlifting, for example, which is what I would got into, um, I like the fact that you get ranked nationally against everybody and you can turn up at the big competitions and see how weak you really are compared to the people who are truly good at it. There's something good about that rather than just it all being make-believe and everyone's great. Yeah, I mean, that's, I'm trying to get my nephew into rugby. Uh, I've said, I'll pay for his life of rugby. But my, <laughs> sister is saying, my sister is saying, well, it's easier to get him into soccer, but on a Saturday morning, I'm saying, I don't care. Take him to rugby on a Saturday. <laughs> I'll pay for it. I think there's something fundamentally different, isn't there, about rugby. I played rugby down in Portsmouth for Portsmouth uh, when I was trying to get into the Navy, actually. played you know, brutal games against local competitors. You know, you play against Hampton or someone like that, or Chichester or Bosom or anything. It's It starts off as a game of rugby. And then normally someone throws a punch, you know, and it's it's just everyone piles in. And it's like, oh, I've, someone's got my back here. I've got support. The thing about lifting, I think, is quite interesting because incrementally you you lift more. You get, I mean, if you start doing most men, let's say I built a, I built a pull-up bar and a dip bars out in my garden recently. There's a project digging big holes, you know, buying the wood, buying the metal, everything, mm. built the whole thing. It's there. Every time I walk past it, you can't not do some dips or, or hang on to <laughs> yeah. the bar. You can't not do it. You know, you, you can't you can't turn the bars down. And I think um, the bars don't lie. And I think a lot of people, uh, I don't think there's, um, I don't want to get my language right here because my wife will probably criticise me when she watches this back because she's a big fan as well. It, when you start making changes to yourself, not everyone is fully appreciative of that. Does that make sense? You, yeah. I do it, the way I see it, the way I see it, especially for my nephew who's eight years old, right? He's got to look, he hasn't got a dad, right? So he's got to look at where are the male figures in his life? Well, he, he's got me here. The other brother, uh, my brother, or his other uncle, sorry, is in Dubai. He's an airline pilot, so he's not going to see much of him. He's got to have a male figure that says, no, you need to pick up heavy things and walk with them. That's the burden of life. There are going to be things in life that you've got to carry represented by weights, but it's going to be the death of a loved one or something else. I think Peterson says something about you've got to pick up the biggest burden you can carry and walk with it, doesn't he? That's the meaning of life, according to, to Peterson. That message has been lost somewhere. And maybe it's been lost because it's a very masculine message. It, it's it's one where uh, I get see when I talk about being pro women or or being there for women, I get shouted down as mis misogynist. But women wouldn't want men not to be there, and this is where we probably missed out a bit about fifth wave feminism, which we probably shouldn't go into to be fair, without getting my channel torn apart. But um, is fifth if we were going to say what feminism might be today? Because I know a lot of women don't identify as feminists. I think the majority don't identify as feminists, especially in Europe. Is that about? Do you think the subjugation of men as opposed to the equality with men or the attempt at if you if you go back far enough and i think actually this is right there from first wave feminism it was there in miniature to begin with it's about seeing the family as a an oppressive structure and okay. feminism is about wanting okay. to liberate women from motherhood which is seen as a burden and therefore be more like men go out into the workplace mm. And that's why I think you get such disdain for some women now who come out and say, no, I'm really happy being a housewife. This is what I want to do. They're seen as somehow letting the side down. This isn't really about choice. It's about doing one particular kind of thing and acting like a man. So that's my, my take on it is that feminism ultimately and ironically is a kind of misogyny in that it is anti-motherhood. There was something that you did. Well, you had a speaker on your channel who was talking about porn, and it came from yeah. that, I believe. I can't remember exactly what he was, what he was saying, but it was uh, it wasn't the glorification, wasn't it? it? Was it was how porn is a tool? Is it weaponized or something? Porn being weaponized as a tool? Yes, he he was arguing that um, getting more and more young men addicted to porn and weakening their relationships to real mm. 
women is a way of subverting the family. And there's some really fascinating science there um, in combination with the pill, because women on the pill are less attractive to men because they don't give out the same hormonal signaling. Right. And they found this out by looking at the tips that people got, uh, strippers got. So strippers who were on the pill uh, got less tips from men, even though the men weren't aware who was and who wasn't on the pill. They could just tell naturally. And not only that, but women on the pill find masculine men less attractive as well. They don't respond in the same way as women whose hormonal cycles are natural. So you've got men finding women less attractive, women finding men less attractive, and you've got porn coming in to try to kind of uh, take up the slack, as it were, and pacify people. So the, the glue that binds men and women together, which is ultimately sex and procreation, is getting weakened, mm. weakened by these two things, which are such huge forces in modern culture. It's interesting. I follow a couple of girls on Twitter who are, who are Catholic women, young Catholic women, and uh, they, they celebrate their Catholicism. And they it just so happens that they they talk about family. They and they they talk about all these things, and uh, I follow them because it's so rare. Because yeah. what's what's the alternative? It's the Instagram. It's the OnlyFans. It's the TikTok crying out loud. I, I someone said to me, "Yeah, Tim, your business teaching people needs to be on TikTok. You need to be there doing putting." I went on there to have a look at it. I obviously only had an account, but I hadn't selected what I was supposed to like or anything. I think my um, one of my nieces, who was six, told me I was making a mistake there. I don't know how she knew, six years old. But um, mm. I so with all the stuff that was coming down to me, I thought I cannot be part of any of this. I mm. just don't, I don't know how anyone can be part of this. It, that to me, there is no further you can go unless those people were naked. And then, of course, that's the next step. And that's, in, that's OnlyFans, isn't it? So is there a way back from that, I wonder? Or is there... I can't see how that can accelerate any into into more. I don't know, wouldn't use the word depravity, but into more. Uh, what is it? Um, what is the word? Where I mean, I suppose it's self congratulatory, isn't it? Self. Yeah. How, what, what's next? What do they do? Is, do we carry on down this road now? I mean, is it? How do we rebuild the family then? Because politicians aren't going to help, are they? Yeah, I think this is about a return to virtue and some of the things that people knew five minutes ago but find offensive now. And you were saying about the, the message of men being strong and taking up burdens being an unfashionable one. Well, virtue comes from the, the Latin word for man. And the two things are seen as being deeply connected. And for me, that's the fundamental weakness that has let a lot of this in. And you can see in the decline of the Roman empire as well, the, decline of the authority of the father as the figurehead led to all sorts of problems with the wives and the children. And there were complaints that the women were acting in the same way as the worst of men. So if men fail in their duties to protect and be the guardians of culture, then they shouldn't really be blaming themselves for what happens next. I, th I think the men's rights activists and the men go in their own way movements are too quick yeah. to blame feminism for all the problems. Whereas really, I think feminism is partly a symptom of men's failure. Yeah, I think you're right. Don't get me wrong. Absolutely. I was, um, I remember reading a story about a young man down in Devon who took a shotgun out. I think he shot his mother, went into the street, shot some mother, and they labeled him as an incel. Now I follow a woman on Twitter who does a lot of work with incels, um, a very interesting woman. Uh, and I wrote to her and said, I don't think this is about being an incel. I don't think this dude fits this whole criteria of what, you know, this. and she, was, she completely agreed. She said, no, absolutely, this guy didn't. It's all in the papers. This guy's labeled, he's a label young guy like that. He's not going to fight back. He's dead now, you know what I mean? So, but he wasn't part of that community. And that community, I don't, I can remember thinking, that's, there's not that great deal of men that actually decide this. It, this guy was trying to get back in with relationships with women. Uh, but I think there's a lack of men telling them that they don't have to go that way. They don't have to do that. They, they just, they are, they're not developing themselves. Women are turning away from them because they're not presenting themselves in a, in a, well, it's interesting. They're not presenting themselves probably in a way that could look after that woman and, 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 uh, and be there for her. But then again, I suppose the woman is not also open to someone being able to present themselves in that way. It seems to, and I, maybe I'm looking too much over the, over the pond in America when I say this, but I think, I don't know about here, but a woman has to be open to being looked after. 
and maybe well we've said now haven't we that you can be later and later and later and later when you have children whereas you really know the most fertile age is about 21 don't we yes anything after that of course you know you're risking not having children i don't know how that message gets changed maybe that is a a family thing or maybe it is men standing up again or maybe as you said by the way all success in life is based on conservative principles maybe that's where we need to look back i don't know whether our current government is truly conservative in the traditional means but maybe we need to look back into what that means it's a it's conservatism not about sacrifice hard work meritocracy yeah maybe it's that yeah those are certainly fundamental principles and maybe too many people now think they can get something for free without any of that being required including having a successful relationship and a relationship is broadly going to be about some kind of compromise and you want to have someone who's going to challenge you and help you to be the best version of yourself and that's not always going to be comfortable but if you are obsessed with safe spaces including emotional safe spaces then even a normal marriage is going to be too much for you yeah absolutely that's not yeah i mean I suppose Eton, Eton was renowned for debate, wasn't it? That's what I found strange about the whole story. Mm. When I was down there, you had, did you not have debating rooms in every, was it? Yeah, Howard? yeah. that's and it. They, they used them. I mean, what, I never debated once when I went through school. The first time I ever debated anyone was at interview for the, the Royal Navy. And sat there and went, I think you're wrong. I didn't, I didn't know anything else, you know. Whereas these young men coming out, of course, isn't it a bit ironic as well when Eton actually bars women at the point of entry to call your lecture the isn't that something of the patriarchy paradox is it but surely they're contributing towards what they were accusing you of in a, to a certain extent i suppose they didn't know what they were talking about in the first place did they yeah it's very strange i i doubt that anything in the lecture about women was actually the real reason for the complaint i right. think it's the fact that it was gender critical okay the comments in there about being trans sexual logically uh, could be extended to being trans species or transracial, as some yeah. philosophers have argued. I think that was really the hot topic mm. in the lecture. Uh, there were so many female colleagues who said they weren't offended by it. And I had yeah. it approved in advance by a senior female colleague. I highly doubt it was anything in particular about um, women in the lecture. I think it was to do with the uh, gender critical stuff. So this is because it's so hard, isn't it? I mean, you could say, well, what is a woman? Well, a woman's an adult female. What's an adult female? Well, an adult female produces gametes that produce eggs. Well, what is... And, and then you say, well, but yes, but other people can be females and other people... And then you've lost the argument because, as you said, then if you start using language, that's the... Well, if you start using discourse, that's the language of the oppressor. Therefore, we don't have to listen to it. We can rebel against it. And now you have nothing. I, I wish I had an answer to where it was going. I wish I didn't have to sort of engage in these kind of debates with people that, but we don't know, do we? Maybe this is a, this is our modern age, isn't it? This is what it is. It's interesting because you did say race car drivers, business owners, uh, they're meritocracy based. They tend to be conservative entrepreneurs. So it brings me back then. It was getting quite nicely this then. Why would anyone be a teacher? Well, because um, who is attracted to being a teacher? You know, you do get mm -hmm. a job. You never have to get fired, but you're probably not going to make the top, but you're not going to make the bottom a bit socialist, I guess, isn't it? So, you're that, not you, because obviously you've proven that you're not, but I'm assuming many are. They go into it for the security. And then what happens to them when they're in there? Because I read something about um, teachers within the States. Maybe this was Gadstad or someone else that said this. When they come out of education, they realize they probably could have done a lot better if they'd gone into, say, some tech startup and they'd made a lot of money and they'd come out a bit bitter. Is there a, is, is teaching the problem then? There's a couple of theories about this. One is that the average intellectual does fairly well when they're in school, but they find social situations quite difficult. So they come to enjoy the classroom environment. They like the idea of following a, a plan that is delivered by someone who's in charge, and they like things being very centralized and regimented. So when they grow up, they naturally see that as the way society should work as well. They want it to be highly centralized, highly controlled, and everyone to be following some kind of plan that's given to them. So the argument is that they don't have much of an entrepreneurial spirit, and they're more likely to go into academia, more likely to go into teaching mm -hmm. than they are into business. So most intelligent people with that kind of spirit of independence who want to do their own thing end up in business. Intelligent people who like being told what to do and also like telling other people what to do who are under them might go back into teaching. So that's one way of looking at it. And I think during the hiring process, uh, like tends to attract like. 
So some people get filtered out who might otherwise have made pretty good teachers for non-standard reasons. And the whole thing is just self-perpetuating. Yeah, that's pretty enlightening, actually, I must admit. There's a reason that Maverick is called Maverick in Top Gun, because most pilots tend to not be conformist, which goes against the grain of being in the military. Uh, mm -hmm. They tend to, um, I mean, conformity, I suppose, is the opposite of, of creativity. And uh, what I witnessed in the military was very little creativity at all. There was, there was very little whatsoever. And when you come out, I've got some pilots that have gone straight into business development with other big companies, primarily because they've got families and everything else. But a lot of pilots come out and start their own businesses. They come out, they don't want anything to do with the business anymore. They don't want anything to do with, with, with being a number or someone who's got a steady pension. They want to take a risk because that's what Mavericks do. And they want to build a business like I did um, and go down that road. And that's exactly yeah. what they do. So what I came to the conclusion was, with the military especially, that when pilots, and I, it might be for some other trades, and I genuinely don't know, but it's definitely with pilots, the reason they join is because you can't fly these airplanes anywhere else. And that's pretty much the only reason. It, I mean, there's there's a flag in the back here. I'm proud to have it. Took it off a warship I served on. My father was military, father's father's military, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Always probably going to go into the military. But if I could have flown these airplanes somewhere else, I may well have done, to be fair. Mm. Um, his language was quite interesting. I remember... I think you wrote something about, because I'm interested in how language repeated over and over again. So the repetition aspect of something, obviously we believe it more, don't we? If we hear it again and again, we know that. And we're, yeah. getting, that, we're getting that from politics now. I mean, David Ames was killed, the MP, of course. And now we're talking about sending nasty tweets online, which has got nothing to do with the, the radical Islamists that, that stabbed him. That to me is, is quite offensive. It's like, how come we, we're not even addressing the cause of this? Um, I think you, you said something, Victor, Klemper wrote in the language of the Third Rye that words are like tiny doses of arsenic swallowed unnoticed, and after a while, the toxic reaction sets in. So diversity demands conformity. Inclusion is only those who are already in the group. Tolerance cannot bear tradition. And lived experience, which I hate when people talk about lived experience, by the way, counts for some, not for others. Um, so I'm interested in this forcing of diversity. This is why I rally against the military for forcing diversity and the destructive nature of doing so, especially through public institutions, the quotas and everything else. Do we think having, I don't know whether you're familiar with the Nolan report that came out into Stonewall. Do we think this is the start? And I'll let you go in a minute, by the way, because obviously you're busy. Chat. Do you think this is the start? Nolan being discredited, sorry, Stonewall being discredited in this way. Do we think this is the start of the change maybe where rational people have stood up and gone, you guys are a bunch of dicks. I hope so. Uh, being more cynical, I would say that some people might be quite keen to distance themselves from Stonewall now that they see it's reached the point of no return. They might want to just jettison that and try and continue the same project under a different name. Mm. I think we've got to be alert to that. There's uh, some very clever tactics involved. But yeah, fundamentally, I do think that the world has become a lot more philosophical in recent decades. Everything's become highly politicized. Even just by standing still, a lot of people have found themselves uh, called on the extreme right because things have moved so far left. Yeah. Agree Maybe that. even the old left-right divide doesn't really make much sense anymore. Now it's like globalist or non-globalist or woke or non-woke. Mm. Those kind of things have come into the language we use much more. There's certainly a sense that we're reaching boiling point and people are wondering what's coming next. So... I would hope that eventually it will produce some kind of reaction from most people and more people will start to say this can't go any further and begin to push back. Yeah, yeah, I think we see this. When you were in Eton, by the way, was there other teachers or heads of staff or anything that you talked, I mean, obviously you must talk to your, your wife about this. I talked to my wife about this and she obviously gets, this, your wife gets must get bored about it as, as my wife gets. This. But in Eton, were there people that you could bounce these ideas off and just say, am I, am I going down a line here that's, not ideal or healthy or is this something that you've seen as well I, was, I think i had a lot of support from members of staff at eton from parents and from students as well the letter that the students put together ended up with over three thousand signatures um a lot of members of staff are too scared to say anything because they know what the consequences could be but for me it was there was no happy ever after for me there anyway my job had disappeared before they sacked me and I didn't want to set a bad example to my kids devoting my life to an institution that I didn't really believe in because the direction of travel was so at odds with what I think is important. Yeah, that's why I left the, the Air Force, uh, ultimately, exactly the same reason. It was, uh, I mean, my job was dissolving fine. Of course it does. You, you age out from flying jets. Your neck normally goes before anything else. But the service was changing in a way that I hadn't recognized. And 
I always I thought, well, it's probably for the better, but it's not for me. And of course, as it turns out now, it probably isn't for the better at all. It's probably mm. I think what happened, pendulums swing, don't they? And they're gonna swing back. But I worry about those people that were happy to swing that pendulum. They're still there. They were they're still there, uh, probably in some other job where they can create as much mischief as they want. And that's why the the long march through the institutions was of interest to me. Are we full, like the BBC seems to be, of uh people still in these places? And I guess they own that with their own agendas, don't they? I guess they have their own agendas. Look, I don't want to keep you, but I'm I'm fascinated in, in your channel. And I, I think my audience uh, will jump on that, hopefully, and listen to some of the things you say. You, you have some very interesting guests, guests that I probably wouldn't have on here because the, the, the philosophical debates you go into are probably more extreme than, than uh, when I'm talking about flying or personal masculine responsibility and development and everything else that I tend to go into. But I really appreciate you coming on. I know it takes some... Um, time for you but i think this has been absolutely fantastic for people and i wish you all the best in the future thanks a lot tim really good to speak to you thanks for having me on thanks will appreciate it well that was crazy what a guy seriously to have him on our channel here it's just fantastic this is the kind of knowledge you want to be getting here guys hop across to his channel then nolan knows a lot of content he does these great things with these short videos as well he's in his car he thinks of something presses the button records it for a minute uploads it to youtube just a kernel of knowledge that's going to keep you thinking for like the next week brilliant to have that kind of knowledge it's come out of Eton. we can all do something with that absolutely fantastic we need more people like this in education we really do we need to keep them in education not throw them out like it happened to will yeah, it's a new yeah. way of working well don't go back to school will don't go back you know what <laughs> I mean? really brilliant guys look if you like the channel guys subscribe as always all right um people say hit the bell i never really hit the bell but subscribe helps the channel here knows that you like the content and uh, i'll get more guys and girls on like this in the future Tim Davies, fast shit performance. I click on those every single time. It's easy for me. I'm like, oh, he's got another short out. It goes ping. Oh, what's it? Oh, yeah, yeah. What I do is I say that to my wife. Oh, Will says this, and then she gets mad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>